Hi everyone, Joey here. Welcome to the Practice Center. Today I'm going to be talking about how not to keep collecting little grievances that build up, build up, build up until boom, one day. In my case, and in this particular story, it's about how I work to decrease, 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 decrease all of the collected stories so that I am not triggered. And yet I find moments when I'm like, mm. and today it's about race. So I'm black woman here in the United States, even in um, Hawaii, that's what I refer to myself. I'm a black woman. And then some people who want to get all whatever will be like, but, but your mother's Korean and Korea. Yes, yes. I'm a black woman for all of the reasons. Um, and I'm not going to explain that here, but let me tell you something that really mm, I want to talk about and what I'm doing about it. So the, the little microaggressions that black people face. It, well, you know that you're experiencing when you're like, <sighs> let me keep my mouth shut because I don't wanna get fired. Marginalized communities, face it, 100%. So see if you um, can, if, see if you feel me here. I love true crime. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. I mean, a lot. And I have for years and years and years. And it started off long time ago. Um, actually, with my first pregnancy, that's kind of how I made it through. I was reading nonstop Agatha Christie books and nonstop uh, Sherlock Holmes books. Like, that, that saved me. And then, I mean, that's not true crime, right? But it launched into then looking at documentaries of true crime, like all of the ones. And then a few years ago, I don't know how many years, five, six, seven years ago, when true crime, like that's all the podcasts there were. I subscribed and listened to many of them. Less now, and I noticed that in me, like the more stressed I am, the more true crime I listen to, and it helps diffuse me. And I think part of, and I don't watch unsolved things, mm -mm, because I think part of what I use uh, to help me is I like a problem and, and a clear problem that then gets solved so that I can be done with it. So it's very cathartic for me. So in that way, I listen to true crime. So I'm listening to this one and it's a story, it's a true crime story that I've heard of before. And, and a lot of times it'll be called the Lululemon murders or the yoga murders. So if you, the spoiler alert you guys. So if anybody is a true crime people and you're like, I love true crime. I've never heard of the Lululemon murders. Let me go and listen. So this particular, I've heard it all kinds of ways, all kinds of times. A lot of times I don't, listen to black victim or even perpetrator crimes. I, I know I'm, I'm showing a lot here, but like, I don't listen to the Atlanta murders like because it's too heart wrenching. And part of what I'm trying to remove myself from when I'm so stressed is the day to day violence and then the glorification of violence against marginalized communities. So I will not listen to true crime. If there's like, um, I'm gonna say the R word, you guys, uh, rape involved, um, children involved, those kinds of things. I just like a clean murder. <laughs> this is so, I know, I know. I like a clean murder, boom, done, okay? So, but there's occasionally some stories that sneak in that have black characters in it. Not many, because a lot of these podcasters um, and documentary documentarians, how, what do you call them, um, are white and they tend to only tell white stories. That's a whole non another issue, um, just in terms of what's out there. But that's just where I'm at, okay? But every time there is a white person that is gonna be talking about black people, already my antennas go up and already I can feel myself getting like, almost like internally ready to fight. I do not like that feeling. That's why I avoid it. Uh, so I listened to one called um, Red Collar Criminals because I like, I like swindles. I like money related thing like American greed. I love it. Uh, it feels very cathartic to me. So I'm listening to this one and I know that the perpetrator here is black. At the beginning of the story, you don't know that. I know this because I know the story. So I'm like waiting. And sometimes I listen to it kind of late while I'm, you know, finishing up my day's stuff. And 
sure enough, the freaking host, this young woman, I don't even know her name because I will not be listening anymore. I unfollowed, unsubscribed, all of the things, not because there's anything overtly bad, but just because I don't want to deal with it. And I get to choose that. There's enough content out there that I don't have to follow every single one. And I get to say when somebody just pisses me off and I don't want to be around that. So this is one of those. So immediately that's how I managed and handled it. Okay. So let me tell you what happened. And it's going to be so small. You're going to be like, that's so small. So I'm listening and they're talking about the court scene. Finally caught her. They're taking her to the court stuff. And it's this girl that struggled her whole life, but was doing well, but she had issues, really supportive family. And so the host is referencing an article. So it's like the article itself, I don't know what the heck article she's referencing, but it's the article and then her commentary. And in both cases, I know they, they're like, oh God, we can't believe that this happened, this young woman she's she's coming from like such a loving family and is so articulate and so now if i have any black and brown people out there listening you know what I, where i'm gonna go and i'm gonna stop right there because that was the problem that was that's the whole issue right there do you know what the issue is See if you can go back and if you are indeed a true, true crime listener and you're like, well, what's the problem? See how many times the word articulate gets used for white people, white people in general, young people, old people, white people in general. And if and when, of course, it's in a word, so it gets used if and when it won't be loaded. When it gets used to uh, and applied to a black person, like it gets applied to me a lot. Do you know how many times I've heard this in my life? It's mostly in professional setting, mostly in when they're anticipating a certain kind of blackness and then I show up, people are like, oh, you're not like them. Well, who the fuck am I like then? Is what my heart says. But if it's in a professional setting, I have to sit there with a smile on. <gasps> and I have so many revenge fantasies going on in my mind. Yeah, so it's said, like in awe, like, oh my God, the rest of you monkeys are running around out there, but look at you coming down off the tree. That's almost how it sounds. And it's freaking ridiculous and annoying. And it builds up and builds up because literally, I can't, I, I mean, I can't even count how many times it's been said to my face, to my face. And this is like after they, they look at like a white assistant that I might've had, right? And then be like, oh, hi, what's happening with the training today? And I'm like, it's me, I, I'm, I'm the lead, I'm the trainer, I'm the boss, right? So it's on top of that. So these microaggressions um, in and of themselves, not a problem, but it's like stack, 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 and then shoved. So, oh, it was late. I knew it was coming. I could feel her getting ready to say it because you, you just know when you know. And so there she goes. I turned it off and I'm done. There was a time when I would feel a way about all of these little things. But I grew up in a country and then in the United States country, then within a family structure, white that told me that I couldn't have feelings about this and that I need to count my blessing and think about how great everything is and how I am just like everybody else, even though every single day I was shown in all of the ways that I'm not like everybody else, yeah? So it's a way to divide and make you feel separate already in a country and a space and a place that you already feel separate. And the definition of the word trauma that we use in here is about an event or series of events, ongoing events, events that separate you from feelings of safety, physical, emotional, spiritual safety, or a sense of dignity or belonging. So what does that say? To say, oh, all of your kind is like this, but we're gonna pluck you out and call you special. You can speak, mm, you can speak. And then as soon as I start dropping F-bombs, then I'm the angry black woman, right? But, oh, you can speak, you're so articulate. I'm linking an article, New York Times article. I don't know when it's from, 
below. They talk about it in, in a much more articulate way because <laughs> I'm just here to talk about it and how I deal with it day to day. So there was a, you might get a, a kind of an assessment of how I'm reacting to it now, but I'm gonna tell you the difference between having the feeling, feeling the feeling that they're trying to have you feel, which is overtly or, or covertly, like you're a little bit less than, to embody that feeling of less than, or at least feel that in your body while you're trying to push it away because you have to go out there and function. You have to go out there and participate in life. And so there's a separation that happens. You know, so I was this person that just swallowed everything and just felt like dying all the time. Like the amount of pain and anger and hostility and resentment that I had walking around my life for most of my life. So now you're like, well, externally, you don't look like you're doing any better. Oh, worlds of world of different because one, I can talk about it and I can let it go. I can anticipate it. And then I can also opt out of that because I am in a privileged position that I am no longer under the thumb of that supervisor that makes me uh, feel that way and that I'm counting on them for livelihood. Like the, the power dynamics for me have shifted. So I feel free in a very real sense, but also free internally because I can process it, I can talk about it, I can share it in spaces that I want to share it with. I don't do undoing racism or cultural diversity classes anymore because it's draining. It's draining because a lot of people um, that, that used to show up in my classes actually were a lot of liberal, um, bleeding heart, thought that they were doing good stuff. And in fact, they were probably the most harmful in the way that I was living life. And they just showed up to actually get a pat in the back. So to, to challenge any of their thinking, it was almost like a double whammy. Like if you patted their back, then they loved you and, you know, propped you up. But if any of their thinking was challenged, then they would be the one writing, you know, letters and, and working to get you replaced and fired. It was, it's horrible. It, the dynamics for so many of us are just atrocious. And there's so much more work we need to be doing in terms of courageous conversations. And there's so much we need to be doing in dismantling certain things and rebuilding certain things. I'm not in the dis, dis, uh, dismantling uh, systems work, like as work. I'm in the kind of rebuilding internal work when people are ready to sit with me. Uh, but for me on a personal level, I just opt out of those situations. Like there's a lot of people who can tell me about the yoga murders or the Lululemon murders. Like this idiot doesn't need to be one of them. And I know that's a big blanket statement and it doesn't feel very loving or kind or compassionate, yeah? But uh, when we say loving, kind and compassionate, I always preface that with you first. It starts with the self first. I am young in my journey. I'm in young measure. So maybe there will come a day when I can really rise above and speak in a way and communicate in a way that allows for healing and all, but that's not my job right now. My job is to go, oh, oh I can recognize it. I can deal with it so I can manage my own thing so that I don't run into the people in my life and cause more harm because I'm feeling bad. Yeah. So in my personal relax, uh, interactions with the people in my life, my community, it's my job to take care of myself first. So I take myself out of sp racist spaces. I take myself out of that and then I'll come here and rant. And then uh, this rant is a representation of my healing. So what do you guys think about that? Hey, have you dealt with microaggressions? Do you hear code words or dog whistles as they say? Yeah. Do you hear them? How do you manage it and deal with it? Because I know that each time I can take care of myself, like shore up my boundaries, then I know that I can fully show up in other areas of my life. It's when I feel depleted and like, oh no, here it goes again. When I let those stories fill me up, that I shrink and then just, you know, want to lay in bed and eat bonbons with a bottle of tequila under my arms. <laughs> So to me, this is my healing process and I would love to hear about yours. That is it for today. Uh, check out the article below and there's so many more resources. I'm not gonna link a bunch of them. Google, you guys, Google's your best friend. So if any of this piqued your interest or you are the perpetrator of some of this, then it's your job. It's your job 
it's your responsibility to this world, this community, for us as neighbors, for you to do your own research and not put that emotional burden on people of color or underserved communities. So do your work. Let me know what you think. I'll see you soon.